November 2022, just after the midterm elections here in the United States of America. For many Americans, it is a time of anxiety, fear, and anger, as the outcome of these elections decides the shape of our House of Representatives and Senate, influencing everything from legislation, fiscal policy, and key federal appointments, all of which can shape the lives of every American. And because so much of the rest of the world is at the mercy of what the United States does and does not do, foreign rulers, policymakers, and everyday people find themselves holding their breath too, because a shift in power in Washington, D.C. can pretend disaster or prosperity abroad. And it seems with each passing election, the stakes, the rhetoric, and the temperature rises. Each election is portrayed by both Republican and Democrats as an existential struggle between good and evil, right and wrong. It is Michael Anton's The Flight 93 election, the fascism of President George W. Bush, or the left-wing extremism of President Barack Obama. It is numbing, draining, and corrosive, eating away at our union by each breathless headline, outraged tweet, and hot-headed talking head. And so, it is no surprise that for the last several years, beneath the loud noise of our national politics, there has been an insidious undercurrent in whispers of civil war and secession, and these embers can be fanned into roaring flame as they were by President Trump and his boosters in the days leading up to the January 6th Capitol riots. That is why for the 20th episode of The Ask, it is a privilege to have on the podcast acclaimed conservative thinker and New York Times bestselling author, David French, to discuss this vital issue through the lens of his latest book, Divided We Fall, America's Session Threat, and How to Restore Our Nation. A veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom, David French was awarded the Bronze Star while serving the 2nd Squadron, 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment in Iraq from 2007 to 2008. Today, David is currently a senior editor at The Dispatch and a contributing writer to The Atlantic, a graduate of Harvard Law School and a constitutional lawyer long devoted to taking on religious liberty cases. David has been a leading conservative voice here in the United States, and I feel fortunate that he took time out of a busy schedule for a deep dive into his book here. Let us meet our guest and discuss Divided We Fall, an important and sobering book looking at our politics today and where our political culture could eventually lead us as a country. David, I would like to welcome you here to The Ask. It's a great honor to have you here on the program to discuss your book, Divided We Fall, America's Session Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We're here to discuss your landmark work examining the sociological health of our American Union in this book, Divided We Fall. Let's start by listening to you in your own words, laying out your central thesis at the beginning of this book. It's time for Americans to wake up to a fundamental reality. The continued unity of the United States of America cannot be guaranteed. At this moment in history, there is not a single important cultural, religious, political, or social force that is pulling Americans together more than it is pushing us apart. We cannot assume that a continent-sized, multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy can remain united forever, and it will not remain united if our political class cannot and will not adapt to an increasingly diverse and divided American public. The tone of discourse in our national politics over the past 20 years lends credence to your warning here. I think of the contested election of 2000 between Al Gore and George W. Bush. The end times rhetoric of the far right towards the end of President Obama's time in office and the conflagration that was the Trump White House. But as bad as things may seem now, arguably, as you point out, we have seen far more dire examples of political violence in our recent history, if I may. A 2009 New York Times story reflecting back on the 60s called 1969 the year of the bomb and related stunning Senate findings on the extent of political violence. From January 1969 to April 1970, the United States sustained 4,330 bombings, 3,355 of them incendiary, 975 explosive, resulting in 43 deaths and $21.8 million in property damage. And that's just one measure of violence across one 15-month span of time. Throughout much of the 60s and early 70s, there was large-scale campus unrest, including campus takeovers by armed students, arson, and significant property damage. There was an infamous National Guard shooting at Kent State University. The campuses, however, were peaceful compared to America's big cities. There were race riots from coast to coast in virtually every region in the United States. Some, like the Detroit riot, required military intervention to suppress. 
The Detroit riot alone claimed 43 lives. More than 1,400 buildings were burned and 1,700 stores looted. President Johnson appointed a National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known as the Kerner Commission, and it identified more than 150 riots or major disorders between 1965 and 1968. In 1967 alone, 83 people were killed and 1,800 were injured, the majority of them African Americans, and property valued at more than $100 million was damaged, looted, or destroyed. The Commission also wrote these famous words, Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Reaction to last summer's disorders has quickened the movement and deepened the division. Discrimination and segregation have long permeated much of American life. They now threaten the future of every American. We also cannot forget the string of assassinations and attempted assassinations that plagued American life. John F. Kennedy's assassination in 1963, of course, traumatized the nation. But so did the April 1968 assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the June 1968 assassination of Robert Kennedy. By many measures, there was far more unrest and violence in the 60s and 70s than in the run-up to the Civil War. Even bleeding Kansas didn't bleed from political violence as much as America's cities did in 1967. Yet our nation didn't fracture. It didn't come close to fracturing. Why not? Why not indeed? What, in your opinion, is it about our body politic today that contains the seeds of fracture? Yeah, you know, uh, going from the, the very opening, the, what, the problem that we have is, as I said in that, that very opening introduction, is that we don't have any truly strong social, cultural, political, religious force that's pulling us together more than it's pushing us apart. And it's one thing to sort of say in the abstract, a lot of forces are pushing us apart. And, and that's just simply one way of saying we're becoming more different. And becoming more different doesn't necessarily imply hostility. It doesn't necessarily mean mutual hostility. Canada and the United States, for example, are quite different countries in many ways. And there's not much hostility there at all, if any really meaningful hostility. In fact, there's a lot of affection between the two countries. But what we have is a situation where we're both growing more different and more hostile to each other. And part of this, as I explained in the book, is a result of a natural process called the law of group polarization, that as we cluster together in communities of like mind, like-minded communities tend to get more extreme. And if you're talking about more extreme on a policy basis, that's one thing, but we're also talking about a more extreme often on an emotional or a psychological basis, so that hostility builds upon itself. So you both have a, a community that's becoming more different. You have communities that are becoming more extreme and you have communities that are becoming more extreme in a very specific way and their animosity against each other. And all of those things together create instability. And that instability is in man, uh, magnified by the challenge that a lot of that in instability is extremely geographically concentrated so that we have large chunks of America that are very red and large chunks of America that are very blue. And so what that means, it, you know, if you look historically, when you're talking about large geographically contig contiguous segments of deeply different and, alien and alienated cultures, cultures alienated from each other, that's a recipe for national instability. You bring up something very important in your response here that I want to dig down a little deeper on. You did cite this academic paper that's very influential to your argument. Professor Sunstein's Law of Group Polarization has right. a very important influence on your thinking on this matter. And I'd like to return to your words as you describe the Law of Group Polarization and how you think it is shaping what's happening here in the United States right now, culturally and politically. When I speak around the country about our nation's dangerous polarization, I tell the audience if they can remember one thing from my talk, it should be an obscure academic paper written in 1999 by University of Chicago law professor Cass Sunstein. Better than anything else I've read, it explains why the geographic separations I tracked in earlier chapters have such a practical, malignant effect on American politics. That paper is called The Law of Group Polarization, and when you read it, you get one of those eureka moments 
that explains so much about our present world. Puzzling events start to make sense. So, just as I tell my live audiences, if you read only one chapter in this book, this is the chapter to read. If you understand only one concept in this book, understand Sunstein's argument. In his paper, Sunstein examined what he calls the standard premise that group deliberation leads to better outcomes. In other words, do we really make more reasonable decisions when we consult with groups of people? The obvious answer would seem to be yes. After all, it's in discussions with groups that we test the weaknesses of our ideas, encounter better suggestions, and refine our thoughts. This makes intuitive sense. It makes biblical sense. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 famously states, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So I think if you could unpack this a little further for us, because you do a very good job of laying this out in your book. Over the last arguably four or five decades, there has been almost effectively uh, a sorting here with the United States yeah. regarding beliefs and opinions. And that is now leading to some of the friction that we're seeing today today in terms of national discourse. Can you uh, go into that a little further and how it connects here to uh, Professor Sunstein's hypothesis? So there's a book from the early 2000s called The Big Sort by an uh, author named Bill Bishop. What he did is he tracked the, the pattern of ideological polarization by geography. In other words, Americans are increasingly clustering with people of like mind. They live in like-minded communities. And and we see this in the voting data that I share in the book in that the number of or the percentage of Americans who live in what are called landslide counties, a landslide county is one where one party beats the other one by 20 points or more in a presidential vote, has been increasing virtually every single presidential term. And every four years, we get a new high percentage of people who live in these landslide counties. So again, in theory, you might say, okay, well, you know, this is kind of a natural thing that human beings like to live and be around people of like mind. And then this sort of gets its natural momentum. You build a kind of a like-minded culture. So kids are going to come into it and sort of, they're going to be like the fish who doesn't know that the water is wet, right? That if you feel alienated in one place, you might want to move to a place where you feel a little bit more comfortable. All of that's natural. All of that's pretty darn normal. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this other phenomenon, in addition to the big sort, called the law of group polarization. And that is when people of like mind gather, they tend to become more extreme. So this is something that makes all the sense in the world, again, when you think about just normal human dynamics. If you get a whole bunch of people, and as Sunstein points out in his paper, get a whole bunch of people in a room that agree with each other on, say, gun control issues, or they agree with each other on climate change issues. Without the presence of dissenting voices in the room, they're going to end their deliberation. They're going to end their meeting more committed to their position. And one of the things that Sunstein points out is that if you have a like-minded group that's together long enough, then often the entire group will eventually become more extreme than the most extreme person was at the very beginning of the deliberation. And so this is a process that can build a cascade where you start of like mind and you might be reasonably moderate like-minded, but you just continue to move and to move and to move as you mutually reinforce each other's points of view. Again, you know, that's one of the things that's so sort of insidious and dangerous about this entire process that we've been talking about is that it all flows from just natural human tendencies. We naturally want to be around people who kind of share our values. Then once we're around people who share our values, we're going to become more committed and more grounded in those values. As we become more committed and more grounded in those values, we're often becoming less understanding of competing values. And in an environment where we view politics as zero sum, in other words, there's sort of no, you know, as, as power becomes more centralized, that you look at any given election as a kind of a winner take all mentality, you begin to see why political polarization spikes at that same time. And so what does the law of group polarization do? It's just an explanation as to why when people gather and people all agree with each other, they tend to become more extreme. I think one tragic element about the phenomena that Professor Sunstein observes in the work on this paper, the law of group polarization, is not only how groupthink can lead to extreme or bad outcomes. But for an individual, resisting the will of the group can be personally disastrous. Right. Forcing people to go against their own judgment and values 
to avoid being cast out into the wild or targeted. You've spoken about your own experience with this when you confronted the rise of Trump within the Republican Party. Here you are again in your own words. Against the backdrop of an emergency that grave, failure to join with Trump wasn't just a betrayal of the party, it was a betrayal of the nation itself. The people who opposed Trump were hurting America. And if those people were Republican or conservatives, then they weren't just wrong like Democrats are wrong. They were traitors to the cause. They were stabbing the GOP in the back. The name Benedict Arnold re-entered American discourse. But I knew that mindset already. I had seen it inflicted on my friends. I had seen it inflicted on my family. Beginning in 2015, when I began publicly critiquing Trump and his allies, my family was targeted by the so-called alt-right online white nationalists who were fierce Trump supporters. My youngest daughter is black, adopted from Ethiopia, and the alt-right took pictures of her seven-year-old face and photoshopped her into a gas chamber, with Trump photoshopped in an SS uniform, pushing the button to kill her. Her face was photoshopped into old images of slaves working the fields of the Old South. My wife was accused of having sex with, quote, black bucks while I was deployed to Iraq, and I was called a cuck, a racialized term that refers to a type of pornography in which a white man watches a black man have sex with his white wife. Hundreds of horrifying messages filled my Twitter feed, but the harassment didn't stay on Twitter. Alt-right trolls found my wife's blog and filled the comment section with images of dead and dying African Americans. She was threatened via email, and in one bizarre moment, a person hacked into a phone call with her elderly father and began screaming profanities at her and berating her about Donald Trump. This was a small slice of a massive online onslaught against Trump critics. My friend Ben Shapiro was targeted with an avalanche of vile anti-Semitic attacks. By the end of the campaign, virtually any conservative Trump critic with any kind of meaningful platform could tell stories of racist, anti-Semitic, or other profane attacks. The harassment you and your family experienced can only be described as vile and frightening. You took a stand for your beliefs and values, but incredibly powerful figures in the Republican Party quickly found ways to explain away and live with Trump, what he represented, and his rhetoric. Party leaders like Senators Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, and House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy Whatever their private misgivings either changed their tune or were largely silent as Trump rose to the forefront of the 2016 presidential race. With all their influence and power, why do you believe they could not take a stand for the Republican Party that you spent a lifetime supporting and advocating for? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So, you know, there are an awful lot of people who believed, you know, they looked at the contest between Hillary and Trump and in good faith, they said, you know, I think if Trump is going to be the lesser of two evils or I back Trump's policies more than Hillary's policies and I can keep myself separate from his corruption and cruelty while advancing the values that I, you know, that I uphold. And I think a lot of legislators took that position, especially early on, sort of thinking, and a lot of people who joined Trump's administration saying, I can be a moderating influence on Trump, and in the meantime, maybe can get some good things done. And I don't want to say that, you know, from a conservative perspective, and me as a conservative, that there weren't policies that Trump passed that that were that I'm not going to say that all of his policies were bad. There were things that he did that I liked. Just there's things that every single president in my lifetime has done that I liked. But then what began to happen is Trump's absolute demand, his demand of absolute loyalty, put sort of this notion that you can sort of say, I am supporting Trump's policies, but have real problems with Trump the man. Put that to the test on a daily basis because Trump's view was you're all in or you're all out, right? And so, and that was also the point of view he took that he radiated out to his supporters. So what began to happen is you began to see this very stark contrast between what a lot of people would say in private and what they would say in public. So you could be in a green room, for example, and hear a Republican office holder just wear out Trump and use rhetoric very similar to what I'd use publicly to describe a lot of his conduct and actions. And then when the camera started rolling, 
singing Trump's praises, praising his policies, you know, and so some of this was this kind of bargain that they'd made that, wait a minute, I could get good things done. Some of it was pure blind ambition. This is the way to get ahead right now. And then some of it, and this is a part of it that I think that, you know, the excerpt that you that you played helps people understand. And some of it was just fear. And I, and I wish if there's one thing that I wish people understood more about the right wing world during the Trump era, and the Trump era continues, by the way, it's that how much fear played a role in people's decision making. After January 6th, for example, there were representatives who told people like Peter Meyer or told people like uh, Liz Cheney that they wanted to more publicly oppose Trump, but they were af literally afraid for their families. And so there's an atmosphere of fear that also pervades much of the right. And so you have a combination of ambition and fear and then, you know, a sort of a bargaining process that takes place. So people are complicated. You're not going to have any one given reason for all of this but you can break them off into general groups. And, and that fear was very palpable and real. And that fear still exists. You know, as one thing I said in, in the book was, if you talk to a prominent, if there was a prominent critic of Trump in the run-up to the election in 2016 and the immediate aftermath of the election in 2016, they were going to be able to tell you stories of withering levels of threats and harassment. It was just something that went along with opposing Trump. And then it didn't get any better as time went on. It actually got, in many ways, it got worse. And so that fear is very powerful. And then, and then on the one hand, you say, if you critique him, your life can get miserable. But if you join the bandwagon, you can increase your stature. You can, in, in certain circumstances, increase your income. You can increase your influence. And you begin to see why choices were made the way they were made. But I don't want to minimize that there were some people who really did their best to try to navigate the system from the beginning, sort of trying their best to say, I'm not going to stand with him on the bad things. I am going to stand with him on the good things. But unfortunately, as the year, the Trump years went by, that number of people shrank and shrank and shrank to the point where, you know, some of the folks I know who are Trump critics in 2016 were like the third bass boat in the boat parade in 2020. I have a question for you, David. Knowing the great cost that you and your family faced when you began to speak out against his candidacy as a president. As you began to partake in a conservative discussion about the candidates of 2015, were you aware of the looming backlash against you taking that position regarding his presidency? No, no. You know, it, I think a lot of us knew that Trump was a unique candidate. I mean, that much was completely obvious. What we did not anticipate was his unique cultural impact. So a lot of us sort of walked into the Republican primary sort of thinking, you know, look, I can criticize Donald Trump just like I, I've criticized other Republicans, you know, even Republicans that I like that I've criticized this or that about what they propose or what they do. And, you know, you had this feeling that this was an unusual politician, but politics was still basically normal, right? So then uh, for a bunch of us, when we walked into that buzzsaw, it was shocking. It was really surprising. This was an escalation of the stakes and an escalation of the response beyond anything that we'd seen. And so a bunch of people had a choice to make. Are you going to just keep on speaking? Are you going to keep on confronting that sort of meat grinder of threats and harassment and insults and you name it? Or are you going to retreat? You know, you're, are you going to be like the person who touches the electric fence and, and you're shocked and you kind of back away? And so some of us kept right on going. A lot of people backed away and it's hard to blame people for backing away. I mean, you know, most people don't enter into politics from the standpoint of saying I am willing to endure threats or ostracization from my family, risk to my career as a result of my political positions. We've grown up in a peaceful, prosperous country where you can disagree with people and not lose a job. You can disagree with people and not face threats. But what happened during the Trump era is it became much more common for the price of disagreement to be very extreme. And it didn't take a person by the end of the Trump era or by now, it doesn't take a person who has much of a public voice to face that sort of shock of contact with a righteous, furious or self-righteous, furious anger. You can just be a normal, you know, father, son, nephew, 
husband, wife, daughter, I mean, you name it, and disagree with somebody's very hardcore right wing and many very hardcore left wing folks and find an immediate, virulent, vicious backlash, even from within your own family. And so what you're seeing is an increasing number of people who are just kind of slowly backing out of the discourse entirely. They're they're just done with it. They don't want any piece of it. And, and what happens is that leaves the discourse to the most toxic elements. Well, I want you to know that I was reading about the harassment that you faced in real time that year. And I believe that myself, along with thousands and thousands of Americans that were aware of your circumstance, were incredibly upset for both you and your family. I'm sorry that you and your wife and your your kids went through an experience like that. I commend you for having the personal courage to remain true to your conservative beliefs against the, the pressure of the tide. And that is actually a really good segue to my next question here. Moving away from your own highly personal experience with the power of popular sentiment to shape communities and returning to your principal thesis on the threat of division here in the United States, I'd like to listen once again to how you apply the law of polarization to the current drift apart of our fellow Americans. In three years of heated debates about marriage and sexuality during my time in law school, I don't recall a single person arguing that, for example, a politician should be disqualified from running as a Democrat if he or she opposed gay marriage. I don't recall a single person arguing that Title IX protected the right of boys who identify as girls to participate in girls' sports. And I certainly don't recall a single person who would argue that it was a violation of federal civil rights law if you didn't call a transgender person by their preferred pronouns. Yet each of these positions is now fundamentally mainstream on the left. It is odd to meet a progressive on a college campus, including a progressive my age, who doesn't agree wholeheartedly with each of these propositions. In other words, the entire group has migrated to a position more extreme than the most extreme position of individuals when the deliberations began. Ask a conservative if they're winning the culture war and they're likely to immediately say no. Religious liberty is under siege, isn't it? Traditional sexual morality is mocked and scorned, right? Traditional Christians are often despised and discriminated against in the academy, Hollywood, and progressive corporate America, aren't they? But there's a very notable exception to conservative losses, gun culture. Here, the law of group polarization has worked in Republican circles to create an immense, unyielding coalition that works every bit as tirelessly to secure and expand gun rights as the cultural left works tirelessly to secure and expand sexual liberty. And like the movement for LGBT equality, the gun rights movement has won in a rout. Going back to my law school days, I was a broad supporter of gun rights, but I'd never even heard of constitutional carry. I was one of the most conservative students at the school, but I wouldn't have even known to argue that the Second Amendment was my carry permit. Fast forward to 2017, and there were a total of 29 shall-issue states, 13 states that effectively had constitutional carry, and only eight states with may-issue rules. There were zero no-issue states. 30 years before, there had been 16, including, believe it or not, the state of Texas. In theory, the gun rights movement and the movement for LGBT equality aren't at all incompatible with national unity. Many LGBT Americans proudly pack a pistol. But since the fight for LGBT rights has largely come from the left and the gun rights movement has largely existed on the right, the reality of the two cultural movements has been to create two different communities who glare at each other from across a vast cultural and ideological divide with little understanding of opposing views. Constitutional carry, really? Have you lost your mind? Multiple genders, are you serious? The Sunstein theory is so thoroughly vindicated that it's self-evidently true. When like-minded people gather, they tend to grow more extreme. The group will sometimes grow more extreme than the most extreme member. The result over time has been a flattening of the American bell curve. The left moves left and the right moves right, 
we are moving away from each other at increasing speed. By itself, group polarization presents an obvious challenge for national unity. Combine it with the big sort, and you have people living in geographically contiguous, increasingly culturally homogenous regions of the country, sharing ever more extreme views. If you follow or take part in politics today here in the United States, the orthodoxy of liberal and conservative beliefs that you lay out here is likely familiar to that person. However, there is a second component to your thesis that I found compelling, geography, and how over time, liberal and conservative Americans have soared themselves geographically. Could you please unpack this further and why you think this trend lends itself to a scenario where our United States fractures? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is let's take a look at historic secession movements. And there's been two in American history. One is obviously the American Revolution, which was a secession movement from the British Empire. And then the other one was, of course, the Civil War. And so what did these two movements have in common? They had something, so several things in common that you also see happening around the world, such as when Scotland almost separated from Great Britain, such as when Quebec decades ago had its own independence referenda. And you can identify this in place after place. And that is a few things in common. One is you have a large geographic area with number two, a separate and distinct culture that number three feels as if it's under threat. So you take those three things, you say, geographic contiguous area, a unique culture or a culture that's a, a substantially different in, in material ways from the, the rest of the body politic, and then a sense of real threat. All three of those things apply absolutely to our current situation. Outside of the purple states, we have big, huge nation state sized blocks of blue and red America. They've been blue for decades and they've been red for decades and they feel like they're under threat. Now, why is there not a meaningful secession movement right now? Well, one of the reasons is the last of those, the last criteria is really important. So it's not just geography. It's not just distinct culture. It's not just distinct culture under threat. The last one that really tips things over into instability is a sense of threat or menace, physical, violent threat or menace. So if you're going back to the colonial era, you had British regulars quartered in private homes. You wonder why we have a third amendment in the United States that's prohibiting quartering of troops in private homes. That's why you had British regulars raiding the countryside to confiscate weaponry. I mean, this is the the midnight ride of Paul Revere is to warn of one of these raids. I mean, that's a dramatic escalation of the stakes of what began as some manageable disputes over things like taxation and representation. All of that was manageable. You throw troops into the mix and all of a sudden things get quite a bit more dangerous. Similarly, with the advent of the, the onset of the Civil War, I talked about James McPherson's tremendous single volume history of the Civil War, Battle Cry of Freedom, where he talks about how the Southern states were driven into sort of a, what he called like an unreasoning fury by not just the John Brown raid on Harper's Ferry, where John Brown and abolitionists tried to take over this federal arsenal to instigate a violent slave uprising, but the way that the North lionized him or abolitionists in the North lionized him. And there was a consensus that was being put forward by secessionist forces that it's not just that the North hated the South, it was willing to kill Southerners. And if you look at the secession documents, you in the secession, the articles of secession, you'll see consistently that they raised the threat of slave rebellion. Texas's secession document, for example, includes a conspiracy theory about poisoning of people. And so, you know, the Southern Confederacy, which was founded to defend slavery, this triggering event that led to secession, because this conflict between the free and slave states wasn't new by 1861, but what is it that triggered it over into violence? This sense of, and often amplified by conspiracy theorists and rabble rousers and things like that, that there was a mortal threat coming from the North. And that's why when I talk about our current divide, that the real thing that we need to be uh, obviously, at any stage, we need to be worried about political violence. It is political violence is particularly dangerous when all of these other conditions meet together. So we had a lot of political violence in the late 1960s, but we did not have the other conditions together. Now we have these other conditions. And that's why I say, I don't think we could survive as a country, the level of political violence that existed in the late 1960s. It would drive a wedge between us far more thoroughly 
and efficiently and catastrophically than it did in the 1960s. I argue that one of the most unexpected and thought-provoking elements of your book, Divided We Fall, are the two chapters dedicated to speculative history, taking your thesis and applying it to scenarios where liberal America, led by the great state of California, breaks away from conservative America, led by the great state of Texas, and vice versa. Taking your thesis and applying it to scenarios where liberal and conservative America break apart from the union. I will admit here, I was listening to this section of your book on audiobook, and it had such a veracity that for a moment, I thought I'd miss the news somehow. Let us listen to the moment of crisis in one of the scenarios you illustrate. It picks up in the aftermath of a terrible gunfight between an American family trying to resist the seizure of their guns and law enforcement. Within three minutes of the first gunshots, more than 100,000 Americans were watching a brutal ambush. Within six minutes, the number jumped to a million. Before the last feed was shut off, more than 42 million Americans saw all or part of the bloody massacre of four police officers and the secondary ambush of the squad cars racing to their fallen comrades. By the time the firefight ended, six officers were dead and six were wounded. All four Randolphs survived, wounded, and were taken into custody. The governor of California called a halt to gun confiscations to establish new security procedures. The non-gun-owning public panicked. To them, what had quickly come to be called the Trinity Ambush signaled the start of a guerrilla war. And they looked at the online reaction in Red America with rage and fear. While there were certainly many millions of Red Americans who were aghast at the brutality of the event, one of the GoPro shots featured a highway patrol officer begging for his life before he was executed in cold blood, many millions of others celebrated. This is why we need AR-15s. Rifles can stop the cops. The Randolphs just proved it. The president won't act, so Americans did. Six down, 60,000 to go. Sitting in her office in the governor's mansion, in a meeting with the lieutenant governor, attorney general, and California legislators, the governor turned to her colleagues and said the words that now echo in history. I don't want to belong to a nation filled with this much hate. The next night, she delivered a televised address, perhaps the only address by a governor that was carried live nationwide on every broadcast, cable, and major online outlet. The contents of the speech had not been leaked, but one word had. Secession. My fellow Californians, she began, words cannot express the depth of my sorrow. Words cannot express the depth of my resolve. I mourn the lives lost in the Trinity ambush, I mourn the lives lost in the towns and cities of this magnificent state. Children have lost their fathers. Husbands have lost their wives. And so long as this nation remains addicted to violence, addicted to its guns, men, women, and children will continue to die. But my mourning is not confined to our terrible casualties. I mourn the loss of the American idea. I mourn the loss of our democracy. And I mourn the fact that Washington is now occupied by men and women who live to hate, who would oppress you, and who would deny you the opportunity to build a society centered around the love, compassion, and justice that are central to the California values we hold dear. I used to believe that the arc of history pointed toward a redeemed America, a nation transformed, one that rejected its racist and violent past for a future of tolerance, inclusion, and peace. I know that the arc of history bends toward justice, but not everywhere, or at least not at the same time. Therefore, I have come to the conclusion that the time has come to form a new nation, one born not out of violence, but through peace, a nation that is built from the ground up to respect the environment, treat its citizens with decency, and shun the war-making impulses that have cost the lives of countless millions. I am asking you to join me, but I am only asking. I am asking the President of the United States to permit us to leave, but I am only asking. There will be no Fort Sumter in California. There will be no armies of brothers and cousins facing each other in this beautiful land. This is my appeal to you, to think, consider, and then vote. Do you want to stay in the United States? If you do, then I shall yield. We shall repeal the Save Our Lives Act. We shall return guns to California's citizens, 
and we shall comply with all the orders of the illegitimate, undemocratic Supreme Court. We will submit to this president. Then I shall resign. My lieutenant governor will resign, so will the attorney general. You will elect a new governor, one committed to this nation, not the new nation of California that I hope we can build together. If you vote to leave, however, I shall present our petition directly to the president. I shall go to Congress, and I shall plead our case. I shall declare that our two nations will be friends, that we shall have an economic relationship, and that we will pledge to never, ever threaten their national security. And if they have any mercy in their hearts, if they have any remaining humanity or respect for our autonomy, then they will let us go. They will let us build the shining city on a hill that the United States used to believe it could be. We will beat our swords into plowshares. Freed of the obligation of sustaining the immense American war machine, we will return our resources to the people. We will repair our schools. We will repair our roads. We will invest in renewable energy. We will create the society that we've been prevented from building. And we will show the immense potential of the people of California. I know which path I want to take, but I leave the ultimate choice to you. The fate of our state I place in your hands. I wanted to play a large section of that simply for the great prose, and I would point out that you have an equally poignant scenario involving Texas and conservative America, too. Could you please share with us in more detail how you came up with these two visions of speculative history? And then secondly, could you please talk about the possible global consequences, too, of this outcome? Yeah, you know, the reason why I came up with these scenarios, quite simply, was I wanted when I first wrote this book, so I, so I sat down, I had this, I came up with the idea for the book in 2018. I started writing the book in 2019 and I finished it in 2020, just as the pandemic was breaking out. And when I was working with my editors, when I was talking through the book with others, one of the first things I encountered was skepticism. Okay, I get it that we're divided. I get it that we're divided. I get it that the divisions are toxic. I get it that we have toxic polarization. But could we break apart really? Seriously, isn't that alarmist? Now, I don't get that skepticism anymore after January 6th. Now, I, my, people are much more likely to say, okay, I, I totally get what you're saying. What can we do to stop it? But I wanted to create these two fictional scenarios, the Cal exit scenario and then the Texit, the exit of Texas scenario, because I wanted to show people how the dominoes could fall. How if you take group polarization, if you take the big sort, if you take a lot of fear and paranoia and you add violence to it, if you add venal or corrupt politicians to it, the dominoes can fall rather quickly. And so I tried to create two scenarios and basically the book stands or falls on those scenarios. And one of the things that pleases me the most when people read the book is they say, I took me a while to realize it was fiction because it was intended to connect very closely with what people understand about our world today. And so what I wanted to do is show exactly how the dominoes fall. And if we don't think that dominoes can fall in unexpected and catastrophic ways, we don't pay much attention to history. <laughs> I'm kind of a World War I history nerd. I finished reading yet another book about World War I, this one called Ring of Steel, about Germany and Austria-Hungary and World War I. And it just never fails to amaze and sadden me to read the process of entry into World War I, the civilization defining, and in many ways, a civilization, a particular kind of Western civilization ending conflict that costs millions of lives, begins with the, you know, the assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand. And not many people at that time thought, well, we're about to enter into catastrophic World War, that the dominoes can fall. And now in hindsight, you look back and you see, oh, I can totally see how those dominoes fell like that. I can totally see why the underlying dynamics at play in these, the combination of mistrust and suspicion and mass mobilization and, and military alliances and all of these, the stew combined together to create a world war. You can totally see it, but in, that's in hindsight. And so what I wanted to do was give people a, com a combination of foresight and hindsight. <laughs> so the fictionalized segments are saying, I want you to see how easy it would be for these dominoes to fall. 
this is not going to make it in the final interview, but I just want to say, I really hope that your agent has talked to Netflix or one of the better streaming services about, because <laughs> uh, honestly, it, it just seemed, of course, it would be disastrous. And, and that's something that I, I am going to bring back into the podcast were our great nations fragment like this. But it was a story that I kind of wanted to watch. I mean, you painted such compelling yeah. characters and there was a, a drama to it that I felt could translate into a very poignant series, much in the same way that I think Battlestar Galactica came out shortly after the September 11th attacks and had a far greater resonance for it. Uh, so I'm wondering, is your agent on that on that mission for us? I hope he is. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. There, I've actually had some discussions along those lines, but it's interesting when when we have when I've talked it through with some professionals, they say a lot of people are very leery of any kind of fiction that would alienate half the potential audience. And my response was, well, if you accurately portray sort of the feelings of left and right, you don't alienate Bring half the audience They They move together both believing that the thing accurately portrays how good they are, <laughs> if, if that makes sense. But um, I think that we actually live in a society right now where left and right can go at each other to, you know, tooth and nail, and both sides would pass a polygraph saying that they're the good guys. Now, that's a common throughout history, of course, but that's part of my point. <laughs> part of my point is that when you reach the point where you're so alienated from your fellow citizens and view them as, an, as so deeply problematic and sometimes even evil, then you're going to feel righteous in confronting them, even if you adopt tactics while confronting them that a few years before you would have condemned. Or you think thoughts that a few years before would have been unthinkable. I'll give you a good example. Right now, there are people in right-wing media who hate the Biden administration and hate the Democrats so much that when they see the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage on the news, they're presuming the United States did it. What? There's no evidence the United States did it. Uh, and if you're going to make that kind of accusation, you need to bring evidence to the table. And yet they have such a hostility, such a willingness to believe the worst about their political opponents that they're willing to abet or willing to assert that it's more likely than not that the United States blew up a pipeline supplying gas to its own allies to try to further you know, uh, box them into supporting Ukraine. That's a pretty bold statement. But why do they believe it? Why did they think it? It's because they have so much hatred that they're willing to believe virtually anything about their political opponents. And I could go on and on with examples. I mean, the the stop the steal effort, the attempt to steal the election, actually, I hate to use the term stop the steal because that's what the election conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory issues, but the effort to overturn the results of the 2020 election. The thing that's remarkable is how laughably dumb so many of these conspiracy theories were. But if you believe your opponents are completely corrupt, vicious, evil people, you don't any longer have this filter of skepticism that says, no, nah, they wouldn't do that. The wilder the story in many ways, the better, because it confirms your priors. Well, now this has to go into the podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I let me just let me just uh, tack on to that. that what, I, what I thought was so incredibly poignant about these two chapters was your skill as a writer to sort of put yourself in, in the shoes of that scenario, especially the California scenario, considering that you know you come from a conservative background yourself. I felt that Texas is far more natural for you ideologically, and so I thought it was a, a tremendous feat of writing that you accomplished with with the uh, with the Cal Exit chapter. And uh, if there is a brave commissioning editor out there, please don't pass up on their opportunity for an <laughs> important important series, not just for its entertainment value, but perhaps for the lesson it could teach us as Americans. There is another component to that. And the chapters do delve into the diminishing of the political entity uh, that was the United States, uh, the political, economic, and military entity that was the United States of America. But there is also the other side of that, the, the fact that a lot of what this nation is and does has reverberations throughout the world, even today, of course. But in this in either scenario, whether it's the Cal exit or whether it's the Tex exit, you paint out quite bad outcomes for the rest of the world. Could you share your thoughts there for us as well so that people uh, can sort of measure that with their desire to see America maybe retreat from world affairs? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and it's funny. That's again one of these issues where when I first wrote it, some people were thinking, "Aren't you a little too catastrophic in your thinking?" And then Russia invaded Ukraine. Really, all that is um, keeping Ukraine propped up is American support and American arms. So basically, what I say is that if we think that America can split apart and that it'll all be fine because at least you know it'll be sort of like this amicable divorce where you go your way, we go our way, and we can maintain our way of life. We can sort of maintain our prosperity. We can maintain peace. And we just, one of the interesting questions that I got when I was working on this book was some people said, oh no, this could never happen. Other people said, why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't it? And so one of the, one of the things that I tried to map out was how destabilizing it would be to the world if the United States of America split apart. And if it's destabilizing to the world, that can be catastrophic. So you are looking at, for example, increased chance of nation state conflict. You're looking at increased chances of nuclear proliferation. You're looking at increased chances of war-induced economic devastation. And if you think for one minute, and the, the scenario I paint was, if America splits apart, then Taiwan, for example, is left to its own devices. I mean, a, a fractured America is not going to, or a, a subset of the American continent, North American continent is not going to have the resources, ability or will to go and fight a Pacific war and deter China. So China just takes Taiwan. Well, does that mean that South Korea and Japan and Australia and other countries would just stand aside as China becomes the, you know, a, a dominant power? And so what I posited was that a series of miscalculations and escalations result in a Pacific war on a much larger scale than the European war we see between Russia and Ukraine. And that that has massive worldwide consequences, just massive. And there are a lot of Americans, and this, this is also not just sort of saying that America is by its very nature helping keep the peace. That's not true. It's America by its decades-long policies helps keep the peace. And to one, you know, two things could cause that to undermine the world peace. And one is America fracturing. The other one is America just withdrawing, America withdrawing. So we don't need, we don't have to fracture to withdraw, but I shudder to think what the world would look like right now if Russia had invaded Ukraine and the United States just said to Ukraine, good luck guys, good luck, no weapons for you. The European countries didn't have nearly sufficient weapons stocks to keep Ukraine in the fight over the long term. Really only the arsenal of democracy the United States does. So for those who care about not just sort of the impact of a strong America on really the prosperity and safety of the international community, but also care about the prosperity and safety of our own community, that our own weakness could have and our own division could have catastrophic effects, not just because we're not together anymore and, and don't like any, each other here, but because nature abhors a vacuum. And if the United States retreats, who advances? And what I say is who advances are in all likelihood those world powers that are hostile to our, our existence and hostile to our prosperity. Yeah, no, you, you, you make a, a sobering point that for the past hundred years, it hasn't been obviously conflict-free. There have been terrible wars fought over the course of the Pax Americana, but the chances for even greater instability even more conflict is raised exponentially higher in an America that is fractured or removed from the world stage in any any part of the world you pick, whether it's the Middle East or Asia or Europe. Um, and so I think that, you know, that asterisk that you put there is an important one in your book, too. Your book, Divided We Fall, does a great job describing our national disunity and the anger coursing through liberal and conservative America. And if it ended there, it would not shed very much light on this topic, and certainly not significantly more than other thinkers among your peers. You do, however, take an important step in proposing a solution. Let us listen to what you think may be a path forward for this country to ensure our continued union. There is no five-point plan for restoring the most minimal and basic forms of American tolerance. There is, however, a model for what the minimal tolerance looks like codified into law. If the Bill of Rights represents tolerance of individual difference and a diverse civil society, federalism represents tolerance through self-governance and community autonomy. These realities are so obvious that perhaps one of the single most frustrating things about our mutual hatred, our furious anger, and our extreme fear of the other side is that the solution is available. It's easily described 
and it's right there in the Constitution of the United States. It's the 18th century solution to our 21st century problem. It would de-escalate national politics, reinvigorate self-governance, and restore a world where every vote undoubtedly counted. Every citizen would have a meaningful voice in the life of their community. Under healthy federalism, American citizens would enjoy guaranteed civil liberties that didn't waver or vary from state to state, and they would enjoy a much greater degree of local control. The fundamental social compact would remain intact for all citizens, but public policy would be variable, customized for local interests and local values. What's not to like? What's the downside? Could you please unpack for us the downside of your proposed solution here and why this downside is still better than the status quo? <laughs> well, there's no such thing as a perfect solution to anything, right? So if you're talking about decentralization, um, one of the downsides of decentralization in, is the possibility of further polarization. So if people, a lot of people have asked me this and they said, well, wait a minute, if you're saying we should have more local control and less centralization, doesn't that just hasten the process of people moving to their own places and becoming further polarized? And the answer to the short answer to that is, yeah, that's a risk. That's a risk. And that's one of the reasons why I talk about in the book that not even federalism in decentralization is going to be ultimately an answer unless until we first start to do something about the state of our own hearts. In other words, if you reach a point of polarization and hatred that is extreme enough, you're going to want to control and dominate somebody just because you don't like them. You're going to want to control and dominate somebody just because you don't want them to enjoy liberty, right? Uh, this is a, a part of the human condition for a long time. So there has to be a level of tolerance for you to support the autonomy of other communities. So the process sort of goes like this. First, we have to rediscover what tolerance really means. In other words, intolerance isn't affection. You know, you don't have to like your political opponents to understand that they should enjoy the same rights that you enjoy. You just have to have a, a you have to have a degree of tolerance that says, wait a minute, I understand that as human beings, human beings created in the image of God, they should enjoy the same rights that I enjoy. That's like a bare minimum, right? But we often aren't even there. So it's step one, two, it's step one tolerance, step two, decentralization, so that everything isn't winner take all. We push decisions down to the local level as closely as we can so that we're not living in fear that communities who have very different values from our own are going to be dictating their values to us. And But we can't just take federalism and say, or we can't take localization, local control, and just say, here, you've got it now. Well, a lot of people are going to resist that because they don't want to see other, uh, other communities enjoying that level of autonomy. And in fact, one of the things that we see now today is that people in, say, Williamson County, Tennessee, where I live, will get very angry about things that they see in San Francisco that have nothing to do with them and vice versa. And so, you know, we have to get past that level of concern for what other people are doing. But a lot of that concern is they say, well, what starts in San Francisco won't stay in San Francisco or what starts in Franklin, Tennessee won't stay in Franklin, Tennessee because of centralization. But if you have the combination of tolerance combined with greater local autonomy, greater local control, decentralization, so that politics isn't seen as winner take all every presidential election, you have a chance to diffuse this sort of constant sense of emergency. And also you'll return to kind of the pluralistic vision of the United States that was expounded by James Madison in Federalist Number 10 that I talk about in at great length in the book. I think it's a fascinating reminder of the origins of this entity that became the United States of America. When this country first came into being, it was formed by 13 very separate, very different colonies that all came together uh, to make up the initial United States of America. And you actually address this in your writing, and I'd like you to speak about it. When people think of federalism and when they think of state rights, they are drawn towards memories of slavery here in the United States um, mm -hmm. and the 300 years of slavery that remain a stain on our, our national conscience and honor. You, however, address this concern in an important fashion when it comes to thinking of devolving power back down to the states to decide their culture, essentially. 
instead of it having been imposed by a federal authority, in essence, you were hinting at that winner stakes all national elections. Could you talk to us a little bit about your answer towards that kind of a fear when it comes to yeah. a, a federalist approach to the future of this country? Yeah, the fundamental problem of early American federalism was that it was a federalism of our fundamental civil liberties. So if you look at um, the Bill of Rights and the original constitutions, so you have the original constitution, the first 10 amendments for the Bill of Rights, they only apply to the federal government. They don't protect your liberty against state and local governments. So this is one of the many reasons, for example, that state governments were able to maintain the institution of slavery. If the Bill of Rights applied to state and local governments, it'd be really hard to maintain slavery <laughs> in that circumstance. But one of the reasons why slavery was sustainable as a legal matter is that the Constitution didn't protect your average citizen from state governments. Why did Jim Crow persist for so long that the key protections of the Bill of Rights weren't extended to all American citizens until really, you know, as we're talking about in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, when you began to have a legal revolution that extended the Bill of Rights, thanks to the 14th Amendment. And so what I say is what does not work, federalism that does not work is a federalism of our civil liberties. The, the Bill of Rights, the Civil War Amendments, that's our foundation, foundational social compact. So you cannot have fewer free speech rights in California than you have in Texas, or you cannot have fewer due process rights in Mississippi than you have in Massachusetts. And so that we need national uniformity and fundamental civil liberties. But on other matters, tax rates, environmental policy, health care policy, there's enormous room for state by state experimentation. So we all enjoy the same rights to free speech, free exercise, due process, freedom from cruel and unusual punishment. But California might have single payer health care. And Tennessee would not, and that's okay. Or California might have one set of emission standards for its vehicles, and Tennessee does not, and that's okay. Because what we want to do, short of with our fundamental civil rights sort of secured, we want to give maximum autonomy on all other fronts so that people can build communities that reflect their values. It is an exciting proposition to allow our states to embrace their unique cultural character, if you will, while protecting the rights of citizens, as you've indicated here across the board in these United States. I think one of the saddest parts of your book is in the chapter titled Conclusion, A Call for Courage. Prior to this chapter, you lay out the issue, the history of the issue, where the issue could lead us as a nation and your prescription. Here, you put into question your own solution, not because of a fundamental issue with the solution itself, but with our ability to work towards it based on base self-interest. Let us listen to your words one last time. Our nation is built from the ground up to handle political disagreement. It is not built to endure mass-scale dishonesty and vindictiveness. No less a light than John Adams understood our nation's unique vulnerability to individual depravity. In his October 11, 1798 letter to the Massachusetts militia, Adams famously wrote that our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. But that sentence doesn't quite capture the essence of his argument. He's talking not just about personal morality, but also about a distinct form of political virtue. Here's the core of Adam's letter. While our country remains untainted with the principles and manners, which are now producing desolation in so many parts of the world, while she continues sincere and incapable of insidious and impious policy, we shall have the strongest reason to rejoice in the local destination assigned us by Providence. But should the people of America once become capable of that deep simulation towards one another and towards foreign nations, which assumes the language of justice and moderation while it is practicing iniquity and extravagance and displays in the most captivating manner the charming pictures of candor, frankness, and sincerity while it is rioting and rapine and insolence, this country will be the most miserable habitation in the world. Because we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, and revenge or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Is there any better description of the culture of negative polarization than two sides assuming the language of justice and moderation while practicing iniquity and extravagance? Do we not have a political culture consumed with avarice, ambition, and significantly revenge? 
The final image of breaking the cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net is a fitting symbol of the fragility of political culture beset by viciousness and vice. Now, sitting here in the aftermath of the January 6th United States Capitol riots against the backdrop of a political landscape where Republican candidates for office have to sign on to Trump's corrosive lies about the 2020 presidential election and a landscape where our current president, Biden, has just recently painted millions of Americans as a threat to democracy for having voted for or supported Trump. What reason do we have to believe that your solution or any solution may be possible for us as a nation? Yeah. That's a great question. The reason we have to believe that such a solution is possible is because it is still the case that the majority of Americans are not driving our division. So if you go back and you look at a lot of the data about American division right now, it is a minority of Americans who are the most partisan, a minority of Americans who consume the most political me media, and a majority of Americans, that's not that they're all moderate in this majority, but a majority that who are on the left, in the middle, and in the right, who long for a better way. And there's a term for this, and it's a term that I use in the book called exhausted majority. This comes from the One America movement that did a ton of research on what it called the hidden tribes of American culture and politics, that about two-thirds of Americans are in, and again, they're on the left, they're on the middle, they're on the right, are longing for a return of a political culture that enables compromise, that enables dialogue, that enables discussion. And the fact that they're a majority is hopeful. The problem is... The first part of the word of phrase, the exhausted majority, the fact that they're exhausted and retreating from our political life is gives us cause for cons real concern, but not despair, real concern. And so the cause for hope is in the word majority. The cause for concern is in the word exhausted. And until we can get to a point in which that exhausted majority becomes more energetic, we're going to continue to see this drift towards continued polarization and a drift towards amplifying and escalating hatred. That is a sobering point to conclude this discussion about your book, David. I personally have learned as a hot-headed young man to try and moderate my own passions when it comes to the political beliefs of my fellow Americans. And I think that your call for decency is an important one. And part of the path that will lead us away from crisis, away from hatred, and away from violence that has plagued our country shamefully as of late. David, I would like to take the time to thank you for guesting with me here on The Ask. It was an honor and privilege to have an opportunity to speak with you about your book, Divided We Fall. I certainly hope that I'll have the opportunity to host you here on the podcast again in the future. And I would like to thank you for being part of our great tapestry. And I'd also like to thank you for speaking up about the values you believe in and for encouraging Americans to speak out about their own values too, in a way that finds us not necessarily shouting at each other, but for advocating for our positions while respecting those who hold different opinions or beliefs than ourselves, if that makes sense. Yes. I would like to encourage my listeners to read this book for themselves, Divided We Fall, America's Session Threat and How to Restore Our Nation is available through Macmillan Press at your better bookshop and digital storefront everywhere. David, thank you so much for being here on The Ask. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for having me. It's so, it was an honor.